Hey everybody, it's Taylor from Dame's Law Mode, and today we're going to be doing a YouTube-based lecture about the mini fashion revolution that happened from 1775 to 1785. When you look at images from those two years, they're really different, but sometimes it can be hard to pick out the individual differences that make up the whole look. So today we're going to do something new, and that's that I'm going to call in a friend of mine, and she and I are going to do a lecture about the changes you see between that 10-year span. Now first we're going to start with my friend Carolyn, who should more accurately be introduced as Dr. Carolyn Dowdell, who has a PhD in dress history from Queen's University. You may know her online as the Modern Mantua Maker, and I'll link to her Instagram and to her website down below. She is an, literally an expert in dress history, and I'm really grateful that she's going to be helping us out with the presentation today. So she's going to do the first half of this presentation, which is going to be about the actual clothes, and then I'm going to come in and do the second half of this presentation, which is going to be all about the accessories and the styling. So you'll have a good foundation about all of the fashion choices that make up the differences between 1775 and 1785. All right, so let's get started with Carolyn first, and then I'll see you guys a little bit later in the video. Hello, and welcome to this short talk comparing women's fashions of 1775 with those of 1785. I'm going to be jumping into it very shortly, but I just had a few notes to set the stage to begin with. I'm going to be looking really just at fashionable dress. I'm not going to be breaking things down by class, and most of these are primarily from England and France. Another thing to note is that there is some flexibility with most of this information. Very little of it, as is typical, constitutes hard and fast rules, but really are rather tendencies. So let's start off with the aesthetic at 1775. Uh, it tends towards light colors and an overall airy feel. It's very frilly, frothy, poofy, roughly, with lots of trimming. We have meringue-like shapes and candy cups. In both France and England, the silhouette is horizontally oriented in the skirt. It sticks out more at the sides than at the front or the back and we have a vertically oriented torso, which creates the effect of two triangles meeting in the middle. Stays create the desired conical torso shape. Hoop petticoats and pocket hoops widen the shapes of the skirts, but fairly gently. This is particularly in comparison or as opposed to the extreme proportions from the middle of the 18th century. The nightgown or gown in English or robe à l'anglaise in French was the main fitted back style. It still is often open, uh, an open fronted gown with a waist seam from front to side back. The gown back is cut in one uh, with tacked down pleats along the bodice. It also has a basically square neckline on both the front and the back. Again, English and French terms. This is a sack in English, a robe à la française in French. It's also an open-fronted gown, but with an unfitted back. The back consists of deep pleats of fabric falling loosely from the shoulders to the trained hem. And again, it has an overall square neckline on the front and the back. Gown fronts at this time are often still open and filled in with stomachers. Stomacher styles took both more traditional forms of a solid piece with trimming, like the examples that we see uh, on the right hand, but there was also the emergence of the compare stomacher in the 1760s that was still popular through the 1770s. This is a stomacher that creates the illusion of a button-up front, and this is what we see on the left hand. These buttons could be either functional or purely decorative. One of the more notable changes that emerged in women's dress design around this time was the introduction of bodices that met edge to edge at center front. I don't really know where this idea came from and I really wish that I did. So if you have any knowledge, information, or ideas, please share it in the comments. I would really love to hear it. Uh, over the course of the late 1770s, this new style of cut became increasingly ubiquitous until by about 1780, stomacher fronts had all but disappeared. 
Most extant dresses with this type of bodice front do not have any means of closure on them and so were presumably pinned. Very occasionally they were laced up the center front, which may be the case of the example on the far right hand. That little sort of looks like there might be a little sort of overlap hiding lacing under there. Uh, however, most times when you see this on an extant dress, it's actually a later 19th century alteration. Museum attributions tend to date this change from about 1770, but looking at period fashion plates, portraits, and other visual material, you really just don't see this on dresses, particularly nightgowns, until 1775 and later. The Polonaise is something else new. This style has also largely been misunderstood and misattributed in modern times, even by dress historians and museums. The Polonaise is characterized as being like a cross between a dress and a jacket. The front edges are attached around the neckline but are loose below. There are no waist seams, which is one of the most important aspects. The length is typically shorter than the usually matching petticoat. There are typically three vertical seams down the back, which are sometimes trimmed. The perimeter edges are often decorated with ruching, uh, self-fabric trimming, or white sheer silk. The skirts are often pulled up and puffed in line with the two back seams. It is that pulling and puffing up that has led to the confusion around the Polonaise because it became common to add ties or loops and buttons to the skirts of both nightgowns and sack gowns in what has become known as a Polonaise look. The actual correct term is retroussé, which means pulled up. So what ended up happening is that in many museum collections, these gowns, particularly nightgowns, that have had this rigging added have often been misidentified as Polonaise gowns when they in fact are not. Sleeves at this date were typically both elbow length and cut on the cross grain, particularly when the fabric was striped. The most common type of sleeve cuff was still the falling cuff, which we see in the far right hand example, that appeared mid-century. This consisted of one to three ruffled tiers with scalloped edges and gradating in size. They were also always worn with engageant, or white lace or linen ruffles underneath, also of one to three tiers. However, a new style of cuff was emerging right around this time. Various configurations of fabric closely pleated to the sleeve, as we see in the left-hand examples, also usually with a some kind of small lace ruffle coming out from, peeking out from underneath. Caraco jackets are another style that was popular throughout much of the century and still being worn at this date in a fairly similar style of cut. This jacket was cut without a waist seam but was fitted to the body through the bodice seams which released into pleats for the skirts. Typically hip to knee length with the skirts being consistent all around the garment. At this time they were still worn with stomachers in the front or may have tabs through which the hanker through which handkerchief ends could be pulled, such as on the left-hand example, or could be cut with bodice front edges that met at the center. Pet on layers are a jacket version of the sack gown. These were also popular almost as long as the sack itself and just a little shorter at this date than they were earlier in the century. Riding habit jackets followed the trajectory of men's fashion. Men's jackets had been evolving along narrower, sleeker lines over the 1760s with shorter and less full skirts and starting to develop the front edge lines that curve back into the tails that would eventually become the cutaway tailcoat. Women's riding jackets mimicked these developments with the same curved front edges and shorter, narrower skirts developing. We can actually see some of this progression between these two examples. On the right hand, the extant example from the V&A shows the somewhat earlier um, style still with the close uh, front edges but with short skirts. The example of Lady Worsley's portrait on the left clearly shows the development of that cutaway front line. At this date, we haven't yet got to the hugely tall styles that emerge after 1775, but we're starting on the way there. 
We see increasing height and fullness in hairstyles with more complicated arrangements than the 18th century has yet seen. There are two dominant styles of headwear at this time. The bergere hat, which is the wide-brimmed, low crown hat that has been popular through much of the century, and the dormeuse cap, all of which will be covered in exquisitely more detail by Taylor. And now we switch to 1785, beginning again with the overall aesthetic. It's still light and airy, but it's less frothy. Movement is towards solid, lighter colors and or smaller, delicate patterns. The use of cotton, particularly sheer white and printed varieties, is increasing. There is a vogue for the pastoral, kind of like a country or, you know, influenced by um, the English countryside. There are still frills and furbelows, but they're not as busy or fussy. The look is pared down compared with the preceding period. However, there was also a greater proliferation of garment styles, some with very subtle distinctions that historians are still working out with some varying levels of success. The silhouette still has lots of volume, but much of that has migrated towards the back of the body. The torso is more curvaceous than formerly, and gown skirts are longer with trains even for day wear. Stays are pretty similar to a decade earlier, but are getting slightly lighter weight and sometimes curvier. Skirts are supported by false rumps instead of hoops. The extant examples shown here are modestly sized ones. However, in order to fill out the skirts of many extant dresses, quite larger varieties must have been available, not dissimilar from those in the satirical print, The Bum Shop, which is always just fun to look at. In addition to these changes, the back pleating of nightgowns got narrower and narrower. There was also more variety in how the pleats were executed, such as the example on the left, whose pleats are inverted to face towards center back, rather than the more standard configuration of facing outwards that we see on the far right hand example. The pleating of skirts became tighter, and while they were usually pleated, knife pleated, uh, apparently, according to the example on the far right, they may also have been cartridge pleated, unless that is a later alteration. Skirts also started being set further back on the waist. This migration continued through the 1780s until they were set uh, from the actual sides of the body and sometimes even slightly farther back than that. An alternate style of front closing bodice also developed, the cutaway front. This has often been referred to as a zone front, and you'll get more hits on Pinterest with that than cutaway front, but it's arguable whether it's a period term. As we can see, the center front portion can either match or contrast the main dress fabric, and stripes can be oriented to either match the rest of the dress or be set at a different angle. It is somewhat more common to see lace-up fronts on this style of bodice, like we see on the far right-hand example. You do still find the occasional sack from this date, but they were pretty passe by this time. When you do see them, they tend to incorporate some of the other common features of this period, such as longer sleeves with pleated sleeve cuffs. Also, although there is no image available of the front of the gown on the right, an image of the bodice underlay strongly suggests it's a cutaway front style. However, it appears that the convention for cutting sleeves on the cross grain continued for sack dresses, while it didn't for most other styles. An evolution of the sack gown that was briefly in fashion during this period was the robe à la Piemontaise. The main characteristic of this style is that the back pleats are separate from the dress rather than being cut in one with it. This is why we can see straight through in these profile shots. We can also see that on the example of the right, it features a cutaway front bodice showing how different features could be mixed and matched more and more during this period. The quarterback or Italian gown style appears to be an evolution of the nightgown or anglaise. It is nearly identical to this, except that the bodice is cut completely separately from the skirt all the way around almost as though the cut-in-one back pleats of the nightgown narrowed so much that they simply disappeared. The bodice back ends with a point, which got deeper and narrower over the course of the 1780s. 
However, there is typically differing bodice back construction as well, being seamed in the normal way rather than lapped. Of course, this isn't universal as we see with the top right hand example with the small pin tucks uh, facing towards the center back. In 1775, the popularity of the Polonaise was nearing its beginning. It reached its height of fashionability over the 1770s and into the earliest years of the 1780s, the span from which these images here date. The style and configuration remain largely the same overall as we saw earlier, it was just much more common, and the skirt volume migrated more resolutely towards the back over the years. These were still around in 1785, but they were much less common. Redding goats are a style very much identified with the 1780s and were popular throughout the decade and into the first years of the 1790s. This was essentially a full length coat version of the riding habit jacket, its name deriving from the French pronunciation of riding coat in English. It usually had long sleeves with or without cuffs, large lapels and collars, and sometimes layers of shoulder capes on it as well. It had large buttons on the front and could be either, which could be either functional or purely decorative and could be single or double breasted. This is probably the most distinct fashion development of this period. Popularized by Marie Antoinette, it was a full length dress inspired by the chemise or shift, AKA underwear as outerwear. Usually made from sheer or lightweight cotton, although some portraits look like they might be made from silk. This style really fed into the pastoral idea that was gaining ground during this time. This is also thought to be one of the progenitors of the Regency style and look. And here we have the pattern from Nora Waugh's cut of women's clothes of this chemise gown from Manchester City Galleries to show just how simply they were constructed. Carico jackets were still being worn, but were updated with longer sleeves and the new bodice fronts. Uh, sometimes they might fake a stomacher front and they tended to have shorter skirts than they had previously. Pierrot jackets were a new super cute style of the 1780s into the early 1790s. The primary difference between Pierrot and Carico jackets are that the Pierrot has a skirtless bodice front, although the backs could look and were constructed very similarly. They also often incorporated the cutaway front feature that was popular on Anglaises, which we can see actually on both of these examples, but it's much more obvious on the fashion plate. The back skirts or tails could vary from being hip length to just tiny wee peplums and range from being completely untrimmed to being quite ruffly. Sleeves were another significant change over the decade from 1775. The falling cuffs of earlier periods were mostly gone and sleeves gradually lengthened over the, seven, the late 1770s and through the 1780s. Over the late 1770s, they were most often just below the elbow or at three quarter length. Through the 1780s, they could be any below elbow length right down to coming even past the wrist. An interest in Eastern exoticism or quote unquote Orientalism, as it was often called, was nothing new. Europeans had long been fascinated by the East. It was quite common for 18th century Europeans to have portraits painted in their versions of Turkish dress throughout the century, and many aspects of fashionable dress from the late 17th century onward actually have Turkish origins and influences. However, it wasn't really until the 1780s that they started implementing consciously overt inspiration from these costumes for their regular fashionable wear. Several styles influenced by Turkey developed. The most identifiable is the robe a la Turk. It looks very similar to the robe a l'anglaise, but has short gown sleeves with contrasting long sleeves underneath. These outfits usually have contrasting petticoats that match the long sleeves and other trimmings, such as bands and collars as well. They may also be styled with lengths of fabric used as sashes, like on the right hand example. The other styles related to Turkery were the Levite and the Circassienne. The Levite was like a long, largely unstructured coat dress, also often styled with sashes in addition to buttons. 
The Circassian appears to have been an amalgamation of the Polonaise with the robe a la Turc, but this is still being sorted out. Riding habit styles are largely still similar to those of 1775, but now they're being worn with the giant hats and hair of the 1780s. They could also now come in a style similar to the Piero jacket, which we kind of see in the central image. The tall hair trend reached its zenith, both literally and figuratively, in the mid to late 1770s, as we see with the fashion plate on the upper left hand from 1777. This was the era of the poof. As the 1780s progressed, the fullness took on a softer, rounder character, typically or often referred to as a hedgehog, which we see in the painting of Georgiana, the Duchess of Devonshire below, and also in the central image. As clothing styles proliferated, so too did headwear styles, and at this point, usually the bigger the better. And now I'm just going to finish off with a quick direct comparison between 1775 and 1785 to show the differences next to each other. In this slide, we can clearly see the evolution and changes in silhouette, gown style, trimmings, hairstyle, and headdresses. Thanks so much for tuning into my little talk and tailors. Uh, I really hope that you enjoyed it and I hope that you found some useful information. Please feel free to leave comments and ask further questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks so much again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That was super interesting and very helpful. And boy, there's about 25 new outfits that I really want to make now. <laughs> I bet you feel the same way. All right, we're going to switch over to the second half now which is gonna be my presentation, which is all about the different styling choices and accessories that make up these two different and very distinctive looks. All right, so Carolyn has gone over uh, some of the clothes that we're talking about, and now we're gonna talk about some of the accessories and the styling that go along with these changes in the fashion between 1775 and 1785. I'm just gonna start out with this image of these two queens. So on the left here, we have Queen Charlotte, who is the Queen of England in 1775. And on the right, we have Marie Antoinette, who is the Queen of France, painted in 1785. And it's really obvious right off the top that there's a lot of differences between these two paintings that we're seeing and the way that these two women look. But we're gonna really break these down so we can go you know, element by element, which hopefully will allow you to make better choices about your own costuming and also to help identify some of these changes in styling if you're looking to date some images that you're seeing in your travels around the internet as well. Now, a couple of notes about what we're gonna talk about here. The primary focus of this presentation is gonna be Western Europe and English and French North America. This is where these styles that I'm talking about are gonna be centered. We're gonna be using images of the most fashionable members of society for illustrative purposes, because these are gonna be the people who are not only at the forefront of fashion, but are also gonna be showing the most extreme variations of these fashions, which make it easier to identify when you're trying to determine what you're looking at. A lot of these dates may be approximate. So basically I'm gonna be showing you images that are about from 1775 and about from 1785, but you may see images that are one or two years on either side. Remember that fashions often change over the course of years and sometimes from, from year to year, it can be difficult to see exactly what changes you're seeing, but when you kind of break them apart by about a decade, it becomes really clear. So just keep in mind that these are not really hard rules that you know this style was only worn in 1775. And if you're using this information for costuming research, you wanna keep in mind your location, your age, your social status. You know, somebody who's in the court of Versailles in 1785 is going to be the most fashionable person basically in the Western world. Whereas somebody who's working on a farm in Indiana maybe is not gonna have the same sort of access to fashion or even the need or desire to um, be so involved in the fashionable world. So just keep that in mind if you're gonna use this information for your own impressions that you're doing. All right, let's start out with hair, which is one of the most iconic parts of any 18th century costuming. Now the 1770s is certainly when you're starting to see big hair. You know, when you think of that iconic image of Marie Antoinette with the ship on her head, that's what we associate with 1770s hair. But there are some distinct styling details about 1770s hair 
um, that's going to change over. So I want to sort of just take a look at these three images of fashionable women painted around 1775, and you can see some of the elements of their hair. They're not necessarily simple. This one's pretty simple. This one's a little bit less simple, and this one is really elaborate. Um, but these are all really distinctive 1770s hairstyles. And then if you look at 1785, you can see that we've got a big change happening here. These are really different from what we saw in 1775. And let's now talk about some of those changes that we're seeing. So the primary difference here is where the volume is. They're both really voluminous styles. They're really big. Women are adding tremendous amounts of volume and height and width and stuff like that to their hair, but it's the proportion of that volume that really makes the difference. You'll notice with the 1770s, the volume is all basically going up and a little bit back, but there's not really volume on the sides of her head. Whereas when you get to the 1780s, you're seeing a little bit of volume on the top, but it's mostly flat. And the vast majority of the volume is coming out towards the side of our head. So when you start hearing about the hedgehog hairstyles of the 1780s, this is the critical thing. All that volume has gone from the top in 1775 to sort of floated down to the side of the head in 1785. So instead of it being like this, it's more like this. So it's a really different change in where the volume is located. Both still big, both still elaborate, but where it's big is what's changing. Let's also talk about buckles and curls. So these little things on the side of their head, these sort of fake curls um, or applied curls are called buckles. And both of these were really critical elements of hairstyles in both the 1770s and the 1780s but the way that they're used is really different. You'll notice on the 1770s hairstyle, they're stacked and they're mostly vertical or you know half vertical. They're sort of climbing up the side of her head. By the time you get to 1785, you'll notice that these buckles are dropping down. These are hanging down from her head. They're more on the side and filling in this area versus on the side and filling in this area in the 1770s. And you'll also notice that while these buckles are sort of tight and close to the head, these buckles are much looser. The buckles themselves are almost puffier, I would say, and they're also sort of drooping down naturally in the hair. So you're still using the same styling elements, but the way that you're applying them to the hairstyle is really different. Here's two really excellent examples of 1775 versus 1785. You have one here where the volume is all up and back. Any curls that she have are really tightly into the side of her head. Whereas here we have all that soft volume all around the side of her head, especially out to the sides. And her curls are sort of trailing down towards her shoulders and they're much looser and much softer. Now the caps that go on top of it. Caps are a really important element of really most historical styles throughout a lot of the 18th century. And the way that they're used is really different. In the 1770s, you'll notice that the caps are mostly closely fitted to the head. There's not a lot of volume being added here. And when the volume is being added, it's going up and back, a lot like their hairstyles were. So these are kind of following the contours of the hairstyle. You see ribbons in both of these, and they're both sort of close to the head. They're decorative elements, but they're not very voluminous or puffy. And you see small little bits of, of extra fabric for the puff that's in the back of both of these, but nothing extreme. But by the time you get to 1785, that's really different as you can see here. So here we have two humongous examples of really big caps. And you'll notice these are really soft. They're really voluminous. You still have that same lace around the edging but now it's much bigger, much softer, much more open and fluffy. And the same with the ribbon as well. You still have the ribbon that's around the call of the bonnets, but now it's got a lot more volume, bigger puffs. And obviously the volume of the call is significantly larger. Now a whole lot of that is gonna be because of the styles of hair that it's going over. You know, when you have big hair like this, you're not gonna have a little bitty close fitting cap because that doesn't make any sense. But this just goes to highlight all of that extra volume that's now coming around the head and like this big halo sort of lace and froth and ruffle and it just sort of enhances the hair and makes it look even bigger and even softer. 
Uh, ruffles are, of course, a really important element to all fashion in the 18th century, basically. And you can see that this is two very elaborate caps, both with a lot of ruffles, but the way the ruffles look is really different. We have a double layer of ruffles on the 1775 image, but they're very tight, little bitty ruffles. You know, you have a lot of fabric in here that's sort of close cropped. So she's not getting volume. It's really more about the texture of these ruffles here. Whereas obviously that's really different when you're looking at the texture of these ruffles here. These are super open. They're almost sort of floppy. They just add like this big sort of lace frothiness all around her head, which again just enhances her hairstyle. You can also see they both have a very similarly placed ribbon, whereas this one is really close to the head. All the volume is here up on the top. And this one is much looser. She's got some extra volume even out on the sides where they're folded in this ribbon to the side, as well as this big open ribbon that's at the top of her cap as well. Structure of the caps is also a really critical difference between the mid-1770s and the mid-1780s. In the 1770s, and also much earlier, this is an earlier style, you have caps that have almost a rigid structure in some instances where these are actually wired. So there is wire that is run along the inside of this cap that helps it sort of stick out and flare out and show off that beautiful lace. Caps are um, much more closely cropped to the head and much more structural and often they have an almost stiff appearance to them from starching and fabrics. Whereas by the time you get into 1785, you have really lost that idea of structure, not only with the caps itself, but you're also starting to see things like turbans, um, like pieces of fabric that are just sort of woven into the hair. You just have this sort of softness to the top of the head and to the object that's being worn on the top of the head that's not really seen in the 1770s. So it's this difference between being crisp and structured versus being soft and unstructured, which is a really critical change in the fashion styling for these, this 10 year period. All right, now let's talk about the hats that are gonna go over top of all that. Here's two images of hats from 1770s. These are both from fashion plates from the time period. Um, and you can see that they're um, pretty small, they're pretty simple, um, they're being worn in a slightly unusual way. And now let's take a look at some hats from 1785. <laughs> I personally believe that the 1780s were the absolute highlight in hats over all of history. They're enormous, they're elaborate, they're wild, they're the perfect topper for those humongous big hairstyles and big fluffy caps. You can see there's a real difference between 1775 and 1785 when we're talking about hats. So some of that is in the trimming of the hats. In the 1770s, you're pretty much only seeing ribbon and fabric trim with a few um, minor deviations, like sometimes you'll see really close cropped feathers and things like that. But for the most part, it's gonna be applied trim of fabrics and ribbons. And it can be added on in lots of different ways, lots of ruching. Um, I love these little zigzags on this one, a bow. But by the time you get to 1780s, you're really seeing a lot more variation in the trims and a lot more elaborate trims. This one has this wild lace that's all around <laughs> along the front of her cap, which, you know, it's a look, that's a choice. She has big ribbon here. In this one, we can start to see like this wild use of feathers and flowers and things like that. Feathers and flowers in hats is really more of a 1780s thing. They just don't work on these smaller, more delicate hats that you see. But by the time you get these really big ones, you have enough of a canvas where you can really start adding a bunch of junk to them and it balances out the whole look. You know, if you had a hat like this over top of one of those little narrow, um, tall uh, hairstyles with a little simple cap, it would just look bananas. But in the 1780s, it works with the bigness of that whole period. And you sort of see a similar thing happening with the bonnets. Bonnets were a common piece of headwear throughout the 18th century. And in the 1770s version, it's a lot like the caps. They have these short little crowns. Most of the volume is gonna be up and back. You know, the decoration is sort of here only in the center of it. Whereas by the time you get to the 1780s, you have these really big wide crowns, I'm sorry, big wide crowns back here. You have these really wide curving brims that sort of cover the face. And the decoration that you have all around them is once again, much softer. These are basically like an example of the caps, essentially. 
And again, part of this is because the hair that's going over, you know, you couldn't put a cap like this over big 1780s um, hair. You really need one of these humongous bonnets if you're going to do that. But again, it's just that the growth of everything, the volume being added to the top of the head. Now, the way that hats are worn is also a really critical and interesting change. You'll notice in the 1770s image that basically her hat is worn almost tied up to the front of her head. Now, this is a satirical plate, so it's a little bit exaggerated, but I chose it specifically because it kind of shows what we're thinking about. And you'll notice this as you start looking at more images from the 1770s and particularly paying attention to their hats, that they often are worn more towards the front of the head and sometimes tied around the back. Because remember, their hair is going up and back. So having a little hat on the up and back part doesn't do anything. You really want it to be more towards the front. But by the 1780s, you're starting to see hats worn more like what we think of them being worn as today. Now, a lot of that is because the brims are getting much wider. So they're actually functioning as hats that are meant to shade your face. Whereas a lot of time in the 1770s, it almost looks like they're just sort of there as decoration and they're not actually doing much to you know, protect you from the elements. But by the 1780s, when the brims start getting really big and wide, they're being worn more traditionally that we would consider a hat today to be worn. In styles, men's hats were always part of the fashion. So if a woman is wearing a riding habit or a riding good or some sort of masculine or traveling outfit, she often would have worn a men's style hat to go with that. And those basically follow the exact same fashion of men's headwear at this time period. Obviously, this isn't a presentation on men's wear, so I'm not going to go too far into that. But you can look at portraits of men from these time periods to see exactly what we're talking about. So in the 1770s, you have these sort of smaller cocked hat style versions that look just like what we would assume, like, you know, ye old colonial soldier is wearing on his head. And by the time we get to the 1780s, you're seeing a lot more variation in um, the headwear, which is just taking its cue from men's hat styles of this period, too, which are also experiencing as much change and variation uh, in their fashion as women are experiencing than theirs. So if you're thinking about masculine styles of headwear, just look to what the men are wearing and you're basically going to be getting sort of the very vaguely feminized version of that. All right, let's go a little bit further down the body and talk about handkerchiefs. So the terminology for this period, the handkerchief is the thing that goes in your neckline, not the thing that goes into your pocket. That was called a pocket handkerchief. Um, so some of our terminologies changed a little bit. Um, but in 1770, handkerchiefs tended to be uh, more closely fitted to the body. They may have been elaborate. This one has gorgeous lace all around the side of it, so it certainly is not plain. But you'll notice that it's very closely fitted to her body. So it's not puffing out. Um, it's, it's really just sort of going right along the curve of her body. Whereas by the time you get to the 1780s, of course, you're getting much fluffier. This is a particularly extreme example, but I just wanted to show you what we're talking about. We're talking about tiers of these big, soft, open ruffles, again, completely filling in her whole neckline um, and just adding a lot of fluff and volume right here around uh, her neckline. You also see the same sort of rules happening with tuckers and ruffles. A tucker is the thing that fills in the bodice line of your dress in the 18th century. And we leave this element out of a lot of our costuming, but it's nearly universal in portraiture from this period. So even though it's simple and small, it's a really important element of getting the look right. And you have to make a good choice between what look that is, depending on 1775 versus 1785. So in 1775, it's just a very, very narrow piece of um, lace or ruffle, you see both, that's close cropped, there's not much showing out, it's just this fine line right along the bodice that gives a little bit of softness. Now by the time you get to the 1780s, that whole rule again about um, the volume of the ruffles, the softness of the ruffles, that's starting to happen again. You can see that's really filling in her neckline in a very different sort of way. And you also get similar but different decorations on the bodices themselves. So in 1770, you see lots of bows on the center front of the bodice and also at the um, elbow, basically. And you'll see that these bows are very voluminous, but they're also um, pretty crisp. You know, they're, they're structured. You can definitely see clearly like the loops and bows and things like that. 
And by the time you get to 1785, you still have that same element of having the center bow, but you'll notice that in these cases, these are all really soft bows. And they're also the more traditional style of like a shoelace bow and not these um, sort of multi-tiered rosette bows. I'm not sure what the terminology is, but you can see they're really different types of styles. And again, this is that structure, that Christmas on 1775 versus this softness and this openness on 1785. Now, by the 1780s, you also start seeing sashes come into wear. You can see a sash here on this one, and she's also got a sash on this one. And that's just not really a decorative element that you see on traditional 1770s dresses, unless it's somebody who's specifically making like what they would consider an ethnic costume of like a Turkish inspired costume where they were using a lot of sashes. But on just typical everyday wear, you're not seeing sashes. Um, the sash is important to the overall silhouette we're thinking about for the 1780s, which I'll talk about just a little bit later. But let's just remember what a sash can do when it's tied around your waist. Sleeve ruffles are something that stay, of course, for both periods, but they're really different in 1775 versus 1785. Part of that is sleeve length itself. In the 1770s, with the exception of a few styles, almost all of your sleeves are going to be elbow length, stopping at the elbow, and they don't go all the way down to your wrist. And they would have finished with a ruffle, a cuff. Typically, these ruffles were very large, very long, and very voluminous when you had something like this. By the time you get to the 1780s, you can see this is still an elbow length sleeve for the most part, but she has a cuff of fur. It's not very large. There's no ruffle from the fabric, but she does have a really delicate but soft lace ruffle at the bottom here. So you still got that element of something that's finishing off your sleeve, but you can see there's a big difference in the size and shape of these two items. Now we haven't talked about jewelry. I mean, it's me, right? We gotta talk about jewelry. The reality is, is that jewelry doesn't change that much between this 10 year period. Jewelry is pretty much a slow moving process when it changes, so you don't see that much innovation. But there are two critical things that change with jewelry from this period. And the first is earrings. Now, they still wore the same thing, pearls, all the materials are the same, but you have to think about what your earring is gonna look like based on what your hair looks like. So if you have this narrow, tall, close cropped 1770s hair, you can wear earrings that are a little bit smaller and go closer to the head. By the time you get into the 1780s, when you start to have all this volume coming out to the side, your earrings need to be much longer to show and to balance out the look of that big puffy hair that you have. So you start to see much longer earrings in the 1780s. You start to see things like hoops coming into play more often and just generally longer, more dangly because you're sort of trying to fill in some extra space here. And another thing that changes is jewelry and the hair. So in the 1770s, you have a lot of these little kind of things that go into hair, little sort of almost structured looking pearl strands, these little they look like jeweled buttons that are on hair pins. Because the hair is sort of dense and close to the head, you can stick stuff in it pretty easily. But by the 1780s, you really don't have that option anymore because hair has gotten so much more open and soft. There's not a base that you can stick stuff into. The one exception is you do sometimes still see loose pearls woven into 1780s hair, but that's usually in conjunction with some sort of ribbon or turban that's in there as well, where the pearls will wrap around the ribbon or the fabric that's then woven into the hair. So you can still have some hair jewelry, but not quite as much. Another difference is because the necklines are so different between 1770s and 1780s, here's another great example, because the 1780s necklines are more filled up and ruffly, there's not as much room for jewelry. So you still see things like collet necklaces and pearls, but whereas in the 1770s, for example, you might see this really long elaborate necklace that fills in this open decolletage you have, that just isn't really something that you see so much in the 1780s, especially with day wear. There's just not enough space anymore of skin to wear really long elaborate jewelry. So the jewelry is gonna be more close to this part of your body in the 1780s. So the big overarching theme of these two time periods is crisp, 
versus soft. So you have a lot of the same elements, the big hair, the cap, the kerchief, the sleeve ruffles, but the way that they're approached is totally different. So you have all the same elements in this image versus this image, but you can see that one of them is crisp and one of them is soft. So it's like all of this fluff from 1775 and volume, everything just sort of went and kind of relaxed down into the 1780s where everything just sort of very elegantly droops a little bit. Here's another great example of crisp versus soft. You can see the big differences between this, you know, small pert little cap versus this big soft cap. Um, you can see there's the volume around her head versus the volume on her head. You know, she's still got the little uh, lace tucker here. She's got this big, soft, um, lovely kerchief. She has a very soft open bow here. She has the little crisp bows on her stomacher. You can just make out this really elaborate sleeve ruffle where she's just got this sort of delicate one here. And here's the other thing. It's not just about the texture of the look, but it's about the overall silhouette of the look. So in 1775, you've basically got a straight line from the top to the bottom that goes out at an angle. So you have tall hair, but it's narrow. You don't have much volume around here. By the time you get to your waistline, you have big puffy sleeve ruffles that are gonna add some volume. And then everything just flows out to where you have this large um, circumference of your hem as well, often with a lot of trimming around the bottom of uh, your petticoat and that sort of thing. So you have this, basically people are like a triangle <laughs> the way they look. By the time you get to 1785, you've got this curve here. So this is sort of the new silhouette. You have this big, soft hair. You have this big, full neckline. And then it goes down to this waistline where you don't have very much at your elbow, so you're not adding waist there. You may have a sash, which is going to accentuate your waist and give you this curve. And then everything opens back up in the skirts of the dress. So you've got not a lot of decoration on the bottom, but you have a lot of volume. You start having full skirts with really long trains. It, it's just this whole hourglass look. It wasn't about having a small waist, but it was about emphasizing the curve of the look that you're wearing here. So there's this softness to it versus this rigidity of the 1770s, where you can start to see almost a more feminine style of look and a softer style of look and a more luxurious style of look. So in 1775, you've got this straight, crisp, dense look. And in 1785, you've got this curvy, soft, open look. And you can think about which accessories you choose and how you do your hair to make sure to emphasize one of those looks versus the other one. So now we can look at our two queens again, and we can really see the difference in how they are presenting themselves to the world. Now, it's a little bit weird to compare these two because Queen Charlotte, who we have here on the left, was very conservative. Uh, she was very proper. She didn't like a lot of changes and her fashion was a little bit behind the times. Whereas Marie Antoinette was, she was fashion. I mean, she was the one who set fashion for the Western world. So she was on the forefront of, of basically every fashion revolution um, that came in the late 18th century. But you can really tell here that we once again have that, that really rigid look versus that really soft look, that sort of triangle shape versus that big curvy shape. So there's a lot of the differences there that you can see between the two of these people. And I hope that that's provided some good information for you. All right, I hope that was a really helpful presentation and it helped you to identify some of the subtle but really critical changes in both the silhouette and the styling and the fashion choices of 1775 versus 1785. I wanna give a huge thank you to Carolyn, who I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and sharing all this with all of us. I always learn something from her every time I hear her talk and hopefully you have as well. And I hope that we can get her on YouTube one of these days because she's just such a terrific dressmaker and fashion historian. And I would love to hear more of her voice in this whole thing. So feel free to like leave a little comment down below encouraging Carolyn to join YouTube and share your wonderful knowledge with us because we want to see more of you. 
Uh, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to ask down below and we'll be happy to answer them for you. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll give it a like and subscribe to my channel where I spend a lot of time talking about historical fashion and costume making. Thanks so much. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you.